Hello everyone and welcome to this new webinar in the Glassfish series. This webinar is about the new release of Glassfish 3.1.1 alongside with JDK 7 or Java SE 7. My name is Alexey Musin Pushkin and I work on the Glassfish team at Oracle. Thanks for taking the time to watch this. I hope everybody had time to enjoy the summer vacation. Uh, I hope nobody's taking on their vacation time to watch this. Or if they do, I hope they find it useful. So this wouldn't be an Oracle presentation without uh, this slide, which basically says you uh, shouldn't trust anything I'm about to say, at least not to make purchasing decisions. Uh, but I should be on the safe side today as I'm talking only about stuff that's available today for you to use and try. Uh, the agenda is quite straightforward. Uh, I will be talking about Glassfish 3.1.1, what's in this release. Uh, I'll cover briefly Java SE 7, which you can find a lot of uh, details on in other places. Uh, but I will also talk about what it brings to Java EE development and what it means for Glassfish and specifically for this new release of uh, the application server. Um, as a reminder, Glassfish is an open source uh, production quality uh, application server. So it is the reference implementation for Java EE6. It does uh, have a good number of uh, developer features uh, which make uh, development much more streamlined than it used to, in addition to all the simplification that went into Java E6. But it's also an application server that was built to be modular from uh, the ground up. Uh, so we have in a kernel called HK2, which is based on the OHDI technology. Now, beyond the product, which I'll cover briefly in a moment, uh, we also have a community of people, of course, using Glassfish, but also contributing to it. So uh, there's obviously more than just the uh, open source license to it, uh, and there is a vibrant community of uh, people contributing to Glassfish. And last but not least, um, Glassfish is also an Oracle product, namely Oracle Glassfish Server. And uh, that means we have a good number of features that are there to um, answer a number of needs that you might have in production. Uh, this obviously starts with uh, the um, quality of the product. I, I did mention production quality. Uh, the performance, uh, the feature set, especially in terms of administrating the product uh, when it comes to both command line, graphical tools, or other ways of automating administration and monitoring. Uh, we shipped Glassfish 3.1, our second generation Java 6 server, uh, back in March 2011. So the reason I'm saying this is the second generation Java 6 server is because we started off with a fully compliant, full platform Java 6 server back in the Glassfish 3.0 days. And this was when Java 6 itself was launched in December 2009. With Glassfish 3.1, which we, we shipped in March, um, we add on top of the modular kernel we had in Glassfish 3.0 and the lightweight kernel, uh, we add full clustering. Uh, Glassfish 3.0 was really a standalone single instance release. Which, with 3.1, we have full clustering, which means you can deal with clusters, we can have multiple clusters, and obviously multiple instances of Glassfish in each cluster. Uh, we introduce SSH based provisioning, which, if you have SSH configured, will allow you to never log into a machine again to even provision the, the actual Glassfish bits. And of course, let alone configure a cluster, deploy applications, and so forth. The entire management of multiple clusters is fully centralized. Of course, we also have high availability, uh, HA. And this is an enhanced and optimized version compared to what we have in the 2.x line both in terms of performance and quality. And finally, we do add a number of additional uh, developer feature or, that, um, or so-called developer features. Uh, one of them is active redeploy, which has been enhanced in this version to preserve sessions of anything that's state stateful. So HTTP session being a, a, an obvious example, but also stateful um, session beans uh, across redeploys. So 
the development cycle is really um, all about developing, saving, and reloading the page. And you know, no matter how many times you uh, save and change artifacts, there is actually redeployment happening happening uh, under the covers. Only the session you have is being preserved across those redeployments. Application versioning is a new feature in last version 3.1 and that one is quite exciting because it allows you to have multiple versions and to switch between those versions uh, with a single flip of a switch uh, by enabling the proper version. So you can just enable a newer version or, or go back, roll back to an older one if you want to. Uh, we have also improved IDE integration. Tooling is a, uh, absolutely key to developers and uh, we have increased uh, the feature set in the various development tools that uh, are supported when developing with Classfish 3.1. Now 3.1.1, the topic of the day, has just shipped, or fairly recently, um, as uh, recently as late July 2011, on July 28th actually. Um, I would qualify this as a quality release with improvements across the board um, and work also on the performance side of things. So there has been a number of issues reported against earlier versions of Glassfish. Uh, I believe we've been able to fix the absolute vast majority of problems we have seen in the community as well as at uh, customers. Uh, I, I think we can call this a community-driven release. Um, it actually has even been delayed to address some of the concerns that the community and the customers uh, brought to our, our attention. Uh, at the same time, it is a highly compatible release. Uh, if you are on a 3.x version of Glassfish, really there's no reason not to upgrade to 3.1.1. In fact, the update center should I have already prompted you that this release is available and that really means that we've gone to uh, a lot of efforts to make sure this does not break any anything compared to earlier releases. This is only just uh, greater and better uh, Glassfish compared to 3.0, 3.0.1 or even 3.1 which we shipped in March. So talking about specific content for that 3.1.1 release bug fixes, I mentioned that, but more specifically, um, I think uh, it was very key for us to uh, get this feedback and we heard it loud and clear from the community and from customers on what should be fixed. And um, this accounts for a total of 400 critical bugs that were fixed in this release, a, a good number of which were reported by you, know, you the uh, Glassfish users and, and customers. Um, part of those fixes um, were uh, addressed by updating the components of Glassfish. Uh, this was important for us to update the various subcomponents of Glassfish to more recent versions. So when it comes to Eclipse Link, the JPA implementation, we now have the 2.3 version and that one is actually way more than just bug fixes. Uh, this one actually has some very neat features in the uh, realm of um, cloud and platform as a service. Things like uh, multi-tenancy are built in Eclipse Link. Um, Weld, the uh, CDI implementation which we use in Glassfish, has been updated to a much more stable and quality 1.1.1 release. Um, the, this update in itself uh, addressed a good number of the CDI bugs that we had um, in previous releases. Uh, Jersey, the JaxRS implementation, was updated to version 1.8. Uh, MQ, the JMS implementation, was updated as well. Metro, Mohara, the JSF implementation, as well as uh, Grizzly, which was updated to recent 1.9 version. So I think that's really key for uh, developers for with new implementations of existing APIs that themselves are defined by Java E6. Now the second part has to do with maybe smaller but yet important things uh, that are new in, or enhanced in Glassfish 3.1.1. The first one is embedded Glassfish and if you're not familiar with that concept this is really the ability to drive all of Glassfish with an API or consider Glassfish to be just a library which you add to your project and which you you reuse to start Glassfish, to configure it, to deploy applications and so forth. 
this is a way to carry along an application server as opposed to deploying your application to a, an application server. So we now support not only just the web profile but also the full platform in this embedded mode. Um, and that uh, makes for better fidelity between the applications that you deploy in classical uh, GlassFish as opposed to uh, embedded GlassFish. Another interesting feature which uh, GlassFish has had almost since the beginning of the 3.x line is the support for OHDI. In this case we're talking about OHDI Enterprise which is a set of um, RFCs defined by the OHDI Alliance on how to package existing Java applications as OHDI bundles. So you can imagine your WAR file, your web application, to be packaged as a WAB file, W-A-B, and the B stands for bundle. Um, you can imagine packaging entities and persistent units as JPA OSGI bundles. So these entities and persistent unit can be used by multiple web applications. Uh, and you can express dependencies between a web application and the JPA resources that it requires. And you can upgrade just part of the application when you start bundling uh, your application in this matter. So we can now formally support those features. We actually implement the OSGI Enterprise. This is version 4.2. And we pass uh, a number of tests which we didn't pass in previous versions. Uh, and finally, we get into the updated platform section. Uh, one of it is the load balancer, which we offer for a variety of um, web servers, uh, which is now available in 64-bit on those platforms where we do support 64-bit. Uh, speaking of uh, operating systems, we now support AIX, and this is the first release where we formally support AIX. Um, we also support Solarix Express. Uh, of course, we have uh, revved and updated the versions of you know the various Linux distributions and with the Windows that we support. And I encourage you to look at the certification matrix to see the exact versions. And what's new and probably what triggered um, this webinar and the co-release of Java 7 and GlassFish 3.1.1 is that we actually support Java 7 with this new GlassFish 3.1.1 release. And we'll see in a moment what that really means. Oops. So speaking of tooling for GlassFish, I think NetBeans is probably the best out-of-the-box Java EE experience that you can have. And specifically with version 3.0.1, uh, the tool comes bundled with GlassFish 3.1.1 and it has improved support for a number of Java EE um, APIs such as Bean Validation, CDI, JPA, or JAXRS. Um, Maven is actually quite improved. Uh, it was already pretty good, but it now works also with incremental deploys of ear files. And Java uh, 7 is itself supported in NetBeans as well, which means that uh, you will see in the demo later here, um, the tool will actually help you, encourage you to use some of the new uh, Java 7 language constructs, and it, the tool also itself actually runs on top of, J of Java 7. Uh, Eclipse 3.7 Indigo um, can also be used, obviously, to develop Java EE application and to target specifically GlassFish. Uh, we have a single all-in-one plugin to cover all of the 3.x versions, including this very latest 3.1.1. Um, you can get this through the GlassFish update site, which is on ajax.java.net slash Eclipse, or directly from the Eclipse marketplace. And that same plugin will actually work in Eclipse 3.2 as well. So one question you may ask yourself is, I get a different number of artifacts that I'm presented with when I want to download GlassFish. So, you know, should I get the f web profile of GlassFish or the full platform? Well, to that question, the answer, I think, is quite simple. I would encourage you to get the full platform. Because of the modular nature of GlassFish, you will use only the bits and pieces that uh, you really need or your application actually needs. And this will be done spontaneously. You don't have to define any profile. It's all done uh, dynamically for you. 
The only thing, if if anything, is that the full platform will just use a little bit more of disk space. But that's really all there is to it. Um, should you choose the zip or the installer uh, archive? Well, the zip is simple enough. You just unzip and start the prepackaged domain. Uh, the installer is smaller because it uses better compression and it actually uh, lets you configure a number of things on the fly and you can use it in silent mode so really depends what you're looking for I tend to like zip because I, I have this automated but uh, remember you can also use the installer in silent mode um, should you use the open source edition of Glassfish the branded version of Oracle Glassfish server or even the Java E6 SDK well uh, trying to to answer that that in a, in a single uh, sentence um, open source edition is really a subset of Oracle Glassfish server Oracle Glassfish server adds uh, a number of tools to help you with uh, using Glassfish in production it helps you tune it helps you integrate with uh, a single sign-on it helps you integrate with products such as um, Oracle's coherence web technology but really anything you find in the open source edition is also in Oracle Glassfish server if you want to try out those additional features which are not open source uh, you can get a an evaluation version of Oracle Glassfish server from OTN um, now when it comes to the Java E6 SDK it's really or Glassfish uh, with additional examples uh, and Java doc provided to you and specifically update 3 of that SDK has the latest Glassfish 3.1.1 bits now the final question here is should you use the dash ML um, if you see any of those downloads well ML stands for a multilingual so Glassfish has been translated into uh, a number of languages and if you want those languages and not just English you probably want to use those bundles and if you just click and go to that link uh, you have here on the aquarium blog you should probably have all the answers that I just gave uh, written out for you there okay so moving on to Java 7 Java 7 is available um, and this is an important milestone release this is the first major release of Java in five years so there are a number of reasons why nothing I mean no major release was um, um, made available in those five years uh, I will not go through those but uh, suffice to say that it's an important release um, and it's also the first release that sees language changes since Java 5 which was already released five years ago uh, seven years ago I'm sorry um, of of course it's not as large as initially planned so things like modularity or uh, closures or, or lambda expressions are not in Java 7 there there are slated for Java 8 which itself is meant to be released late 2012 uh, but I think it's more important this Java 7 release than what uh, most people think um, and I'll, I'll get to some of the new features that I find interesting but remember again Java 7 is here and you should probably try it out so Java SE 7 content um, there are language changes as I just mentioned and these are grouped under the umbrella of GSR 334 which is project coin I'll actually go through some of those changes with some code samples and the demo will get it to that as well there are class library changes uh, mostly in two areas the first one is new IO2 um, so new IO2 which is probably not the best name we could we could find but this is the follow-up to new IO which itself was new and introduced in JDK 1.4 I guess the second class library is a fork joint framework which is really uh, the ability for you to write code that is um, able to leverage the underlying multi-core architecture that is more and more common today uh, the DaVinci project and the Invoke Dynamic Bytecode fall under the category of uh, JVM changes. And this really um, has an impact for people uh, implementing scripting and dynamic languages on top of the JVM more than it impacts you and certainly Java EE server-side developers. 
but this can turn out to be a, a very big deal for those people implementing and for you in turn if you are using those dynamic and, and uh, um, scripting languages on top of the JVM. And of course we have this miscellaneous category which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, the new I.O. Uh, API has been ready for a while. It's now baked into JDK 7. It has a file system API, a modern one, I should say, which lets you, you know, move, delete, or copy contents of a file with simple um, um, a, with a simple API as opposed to, you know, working with buffers and and copying arrays of bytes uh, one at a time. Um, you can walk the file system tree. Uh, you can access POSIX attributes if you are using a POSIX file system. Uh, symbolic links is something you can have access to as well. Uh, one interesting feature is that you can actually listen for changes in, 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 in a given file for a size, a modification date, or for a directory, for a new file created in a given directory, for example. So there are lots of new um, nice APIs when working with file systems. Um, in the IO API, there's also um, enhancements to the asynchronous IO APIs and, and a few other things that fall under that network and file system category. Um, I have links to um, further information if you're interested in knowing more about those. Uh, invoke dynamic, as I mentioned, isn't really meant to be used by Java the language. It's really for all of those languages, and there are new ones coming out almost every month, uh, running on the JVM, and and um, that probably uh, can use some help when it comes to performance and um, facility of uh, implementing their favorite language on top of the JVM. So that's really what Invoke Dynamic is, is meant for. Um, now, interestingly enough, Invoke Dynamic will also be used in the Java language, most likely in Java 8, to implement Lambda uh, expressions. So here's the miscellaneous category. Um, we will actually show JDBC 4.1, which was slightly changed to take advantage of some JDK 7 features in the demo. So uh, let me not talk about this right now. <coughs> um, there are uh, updates to the security side of things, uh, updates to SSL TLS 1.2, the latest version. Um, ECC is now supported. Unicode was updated to version 6. Updates to the XML stack, JAXP, JAXWS, JAXB as well. Uh, some swing enhancements when it comes to the uh, look and feel called Nimbus. The introduction of something called JX layer and a few other things. Uh, and certainly um, application server vendors are welcoming the uh, uh, class loading architecture changes and uh, simplifications. Um, and last but maybe not least, there we can now skin Java Doc with CSS, so you can actually uh, give it your own look and feel if uh, that's what you want to do. So specifically, uh, Oracle's implementation of Java 7, Oracle JDK 7, uh, was made available on July 28, 2011, and you can probably expect uh, update releases in the coming months. Uh, the supported platforms are listed here, obviously Windows, um, Oracle, Linux, Red Hat Linux, SUSE, Ubuntu Linux, and Solaris on both x86 and Spark platforms. There is no uh, Mac OS X support yet, uh, but in the meantime, you're encouraged to use OpenJDK, which has um, not official builds, but for server-side development, they work just fine, or at least they have for me. Uh, it will be. Uh, it will take a few months before uh, JDK 7 is officially supported on Mac OS X. So um, bridging the two, Java E6 and JDK 7, does it make any sense to use JDK 7 in Java E6 development and with Glassfish 3.1.1 specifically? Well, yes, it does because first of all, Glassfish now is fully tested and supported on JDK 7. 
So um, you can obviously file bugs uh, if you have a support contract, if you're an Oracle Glassfish Server customer uh, when running on JDK 7. Um, something else that's new is that the Java E6 SDK Update 3, which I mentioned previously, is available as a bundle with JDK 7 if you want a single archive to install both the JDK and Glassfish and the Java E6 SDK documentation. Um, I did mention the updated XML uh, stack and we obviously benefit from that on the Glassfish side of things and Glassfish in general benefits from having a, a more modern JDK which comes with a number of performance enhancements. Um, and Project Coin itself, the new language changes, is probably one of the obvious benefits for Java EE developers. Um, this is where you can start using strings in switch statements. Uh, this is where you can have the try with resource syntax. We'll, we'll see that in details in a moment. Um, Multi-catch and maybe the diamond operator, which lets the compiler infer the type of a generic uh, based on the left side of the, uh, of the assignment. So um, with that, let's walk you through a number of examples. So imagine this is a um, the use of a string and switch statements. This is um, existing code here, probably in a servlet. So request is the servlet request. And from there, we get a parameter called name. And if we're talking to Duke, well, it's a VIP, and we want to uppercase um, Duke's name. If it's Sparky, it's another VIP, but we'll just leave his uh, name alone. The way that could be refactored uh, to use the new coin feature is like this. Um, still get the parameter name, and then we switch on that variable. And then we have the typical cases with uh, breaks. So if in the case of Duke, it is a VIP, we uppercase and we break. If it's Sparky, it's just a VIP and then we break. Um, you're all, of course, welcome to keep using the existing if, else, if, and else statements, but I think it's a bit more readable using the switch um, syntax. The second example from Project Coin is JDBC 4.0, and specifically uh, the try with resources. Um, a typical way to uh, execute some request uh, using JDBC against the database is by grabbing a connection from a data source which itself was probably injected, creating a statement from that connection and executing a query on the statement and getting a result set back. And you know once you've parsed the result set you want to be uh, closing the statement and the connection. And if you start closing one before the other you might run into trouble. And if you forget to close them you might run into trouble as well. So what the try with resource syntax offers is the ability to um, initialize in the try statement both the connection and the statement in a couple of statements here. Um, and because the compiler is smart enough here, you don't have to close those resources. When they go out of scope, the compiler does the right thing and uh, cleans and closes those uh, resources. Uh, this is because in JVC 4.1, both the connection and the statement API have been modified to implement an additional interface, which is called auto-closable. Now, the last example that I have here is called multi-catch, yet another uh, evolution in the Java language with Project Coin. Um, this is using JPA on an entity manager when I'm creating a name query called find XYZ. I'm setting a parameter, which is a customer name I'm looking for. I'm setting a lock mode to be pessimistic right. This is new in JPA 2.0. And finally getting the result list and then doing something with um, the collection of customers that was returned. As you can see here, I'm catching two potential exceptions, uh, which are both lock related. And the only thing I'm doing here is really logging the fact that something wrong happened. Um, and I'm doing the exact same thing in both catch blocks. What multi-catch offers here is the ability to 
um, have one single catch statement which catches both pessimistic lock exception and lock timeout exception with a single uh, block actually doing in my case the logging. Uh, so that's yet another way how you can use that in a Java E6 and specifically here in a JPA API how you can use those um, new features from the language in Java 7. So with that let me um, go into a quick demonstration which is also available on the Glassfish YouTube channel showing exactly those three examples uh, of using uh, Java 7 project coin features in a simple Java E6 application. Hello and welcome to a new screencast about Glassfish, the open source application server. Uh, this uh, webcast is about Java E6 running on Java 7 and with Glassfish 3.1.1 which supports Java 7. We have a small web application here with a um, servlet, a 3.0 servlet, uh, that we'll be using in EGB, which we'll see in a moment, and which parses a parameter called name, which it gets as part of the request, and uh, looks for Duke or Sparky as the names, and considers both of them as VIPs and uppercases Duke, uh, so we can visually recognize him. And then it does a small uh, set of printouts here uh, with an exclamation mark for uh, any VIP that we may come across. Uh, and then it talks to uh, an EJB, returns the fact uh, whether it's an existing customer or not, and prints out some details, as well as the result of a system property called Java Runtime Version. And we'll see uh, how we can run on Java 6 as well as on Java 7. Now that does customer exist method is part of an EJB, a stateless testing bean, which is packaged as part of the WAR file you see here, and which also comes with a data source definition, which is a new way in Java 6 to define a connection to a database with uh, a name, which you can then later uh, inject using an add resource annotation and this lookup attribute. Um, and we actually also have in that EJB a ping DB database um, method, which is called once the component is instantiated. Um, so we actually test the connection at that point. Uh, we get a connection, create a statement. This is standard um, JDBC using the data source we've injected before. And we print out uh, some of the things. And we obviously need to close both the statement and the connection. And we'll see how that can be improved in Java 7. We'll also inject an entity manager, this is standard JPA, and in that case, uh, we, in that does customer exist method, uh, invoke a query called final customers with name. That query is actually defined on the customer entity, this is a JPA entity, uh, which has this name query defined. And it uses JPQL as a query language here to get all the customers where name is whichever parameter you'll pass. And speaking of parameter, we set that parameter to the name we've been passed. Uh, we use a lock mode, which is pessimistic right here. Um, and this is mainly for demo purposes. There are different lock modes, some of which were introduced in JPA 2.0. And we get the result, um, the list of result. If that list is empty, well, clearly there is no such uh, customer. So we go ahead and create one, set its name, and persist to the database. Otherwise, uh, we return true because we actually found something. And in the process of doing all of this, we can actually catch a number of exceptions, which are both uh, persistent exceptions, but specialized with uh, locking. And in that case, we just print out something and we have the same printout in both cases. Now, uh, let's run actually this application. We're actually running on Java 6, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, this will actually compile everything and deploy to Glassfish 3.1.1. And um, this is the URL which passes the Sparky name in this case. And you see I've always, always already been playing with the um, application. Sparky is already a customer. Sparky 1, though, is not and was just added as a new customer. Uh, we can also try to see if Duke is indeed recognized. 
and it's a new customer but it is recognized as both a VIP and as Duke and as you see here it's uppercased and you know, one more try we can see if Alexi exists and Alexi is added as a new customer and as you can see all of this is done with the latest JDK 1.6 version so let's now go back uh, to the IDE this is NetBeans 7.0.1 and undeploy the application uh, for one, and the second thing we'll do is actually also shut down Glassfish itself. Uh, we'll actually upgrade everybody to JDK 7. That's the runtime, Glassfish, we'll do that in a moment, as well as the application itself we're, we're de uh, developing in NetBeans. So, um, going to the project properties of this web application project, and the libraries, the platform is set to JDK 6, and that's the only choice that we have here. So we can uh, bring the platform manager and navigate to an install of the um, recently released JDK 7. Uh, define this and actually select this as being uh, the platform we want to use. And we also need in the source to make sure the format of the source is recognized as being JDK 7, which is a new option we now have. We'll come back to the code and what we can do in a moment, uh, but before we do that, we actually need to update, update Glassfish as well. So one way to do it, there are multiple ways, and I'll show you a second way in a moment, is to actually go ahead and edit a configuration file at Glassfish. Um, so this is the JDK version we want to be using, and we'll edit a file called asenv.conf in the config directory. And we'll add one um, variable here, uh, which is called as underscore Java, and simply point to the um, equivalent of Java home. In my case, this is um, my home directory, JDK 1.7.0. So with that, we'll actually uh, go back to the IDE, uh, go to the services tab, and restart Glassfish. So while Glassfish is starting, it should really only take a few seconds, we can actually go and uh, look at the um, admin console of Glassfish that it has started. Uh, and we can see uh, in the JVM report that we are indeed using JDK 1.7.0, so Java 7. And we can probably uh, look for the appropriate uh, environment variables uh, or properties here. Yes, there you go, 1.7.0. Now, um, going back to um, the IDE, um, I also want to point out another way you can change the runtime for Glassfish. In this uh, Java tab, you can actually point to an executable for Java. So that would be JDK 1.7.0 slash bin slash Java but that will only uh, affect Glassfish when ran uh, from within NetBeans. So now the interesting cool part, let's use Project Coin, uh, and specifically one of the new language features which supports strings in switch statements. So here you see NetBeans has actually offered you to switch to the switch syntax. So now we have a switch on a string, and we have various cases for dealing with Duke, Sparky, both are VAPs, and a default one. Uh, there are two more things that I'd like to show you that relate to Java 7, specifically Project Coin. One has to do with the fact you can use try with resources now, which is an ability for the developer to uh, initialize, initialize variables and not having to deal about how uh, they are closed. So here the connection is being initiated as part of the try statement. And that is possible because it actually, as part of JDBC 4.1, implements the auto-closable interface, which itself is part of Java 7. So uh, the compiler will actually do the right thing for you and close those resources when they go out of scope. And you can similarly, because statement also implements that variable, uh, use the quick tip from NetBeans to apply the try uh, with resources syntax, which will this time initiate initialize two variables and you no longer have to close them. Uh, now, finally, the last one I'd like to show, uh, we'll scroll down a little bit here, 
is um, the so-called multi-catch feature. Uh, if you remember, uh, I was doing this pessimistic right um, search, and there are two exceptions that I'm catching here, and both of them um, extend persistence exception. So pers pessimistic lock exception and lock timeout exception. So and since we're doing exactly the same thing in those catch blocks, we can actually use here the multi-catch syntax, which will, in the same catch, declare two exceptions and have just one catch block. So um, with that we can actually see that everything still works. This is a mere uh, just refactoring. So run the application and um, this time we're running obviously Glassfish on JDK 7 and there you go, voila! Uh, welcome Sparky, a new customer, that's a new deployment. Uh, you can try uh, the other ones, and specifically Duke. And Duke is now running on JDK 7, on Java 7, on Glassfish 3.1.1. Thanks for watching this screencast. You can get your Glassfish at glassfish.org and send some feedback as you have it. Thank you. So there, this was the, the demo. Uh, I'd like to leave you with a number of resources for Glassfish 3.1.1. Glassfish.org is the homepage for everything open source related. If you'd like to try out Oracle Glassfish server with all the additional administrative features and performance enhancements that I mentioned, go to oracle.com slash go to slash Glassfish. If you're interested in uh, the extensive documentation we have for both uh, the open source and the Glassfish server, uh, glassfish.org slash docs has all the links to those. And if you go to the 3.1.1 tag on the Aquarium blog, you'll find uh, the podcast we did for the 3.1.1 release, the screencast, which I just showed, and a few others, documentations, bundles to downloads, and so forth. For Java 7, um, Java SE is um, where you get the download and a lot more. The tutorial is, has obviously been updated to Java 7, and the last link here is where you'll find more details on, say, Project Coin, UIO2, the Frog Joint Framework, and uh, Invoke Dynamic, as this was all presented during the launch of Java 7 in early July 2011. And finally, remember that glassfish.org slash webinars is where we have all the webinars um, announced and archived, so you probably want to keep an eye on this one. Uh, blogs.oracle.com slash the aquarium is the daily blog we have on everything Java EE, Glassfish, and um, Java uh, happening at Oracle. And also don't forget Java 1 is around the corner in October 2011 in San Francisco. We'll have plenty of Java EE and Glassfish coverage, as well as a community and a party event around Glassfish. So make sure you uh, don't miss out on those events. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, invite you to try out Glassfish 3.1.1 and Java 7. Thanks.